Hey folks, JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 77, Press Conference, Part 1. Before we get started, as always, folks, I'll do my song and dance and ask you to hit that subscribe button if you get a chance. I sure would appreciate it. Also, get down in that description, click on the link, and follow my podcast. Go over to the Facebook site, my website, buy you a copy of the book, copy of the documentary. Also, if you need a little history lesson, my daughter and I are doing Snowy and Boom. Now, if you want to grab a seat and get in on some history you may not have heard of, just be sure and come visit us on our site. All right, folks, we're going to get into the first part of the press conference here that Director Holt gave to the media. We'll see where that goes. We're going to try to make an effort to explain to you in greatest detail as we possibly can the tragic situation that occurred in our city last week. We ask that you do understand what we are attempting to do this morning in such exhaustive detail in a matter of days is normally a summary or consolidation of events and time sequences that would take several weeks to prepare. We felt that there was an urgency that we proceed immediately, though, so that the citizens of our city could be as fully informed as to what occurred as we are able to give you at this particular time. I'll also ask you to remember that as I go through the presentation, most of what I give you, we consider facts at this point. Some of what I give you will be conjecture. We believe, and as I get to those particular points, I'll indicate that these are the beliefs that we now hold based on the physical evidence that is available at this particular point. We still have a lot of work to do, ballistic work, analysis of trajectories, injuries. All of these things take weeks and in some cases even months to complete. But as I say, we feel that we owe to the citizens of our city. We have displayed during the past week a support, a concern that exceeds anything I have ever dreamed of. We have received from black, white, young, old, male, female, numerous expressions of support, of concern over this tragic situation. We feel that we owe our citizens the most detailed explanation possible at this point. This is going to be a fairly lengthy presentation, and at several points during the presentation, there will be some language used, some obscenities used, perhaps by myself, but especially on some tapes that we will be using that the news media need to be aware of and take into consideration for your broadcast purposes. I'd like to begin, I guess, by identifying the people that were involved in this tragic situation. As you all know, the tragedy resulted in the death of eight people, including the officer, Hester. In addition to Officer Hester, there was Lindbergh Sanders, Larnell Sanders, Michael Delane Coleman, David Lee Jordan, Andrew Houston, Cassell Harris, and Earl Thomas. There were an additional seven people in the house at the time this tragedy commenced. Those people are Tyrone Henley, James Murphy, Thomas Carter Smith, Reginald McRae, Jackie Robinson Young, Fred Lee Davis, and Joe E. Coleman, Jr. From the information we've been able to develop, this group of people were gathered in the house on Shannon. 
and had been gathered there for approximately three days as part of a meeting that to them carried or had religious connotations. It involved Bible study, but also involved extensive use of marijuana and the consumption of alcohol beverages, I'm sorry, alcoholic beverages, particularly wine. So we have 14 people, or at least these 14 people, possibly others, at one point or another, that are there almost for a full three days prior to the call that precipitated the tragedy that followed. We've been able, through the investigation, both during the time this incident was going on and since, to develop some idea of the group of people we were dealing with although at the time we had no information, no knowledge of this particular group. Apparently the group had no formal name, and as far as we know, they had no printed literature, practiced no particular or prescribed rituals, nor did they have any particular symbols of identification. There was no initiation fees, no dues paid, or no outside solicitation of funds insofar as we can determine. The commitment of the cult members ranged from those with a complete devotion to Lindbergh Sanders or to those whose main interest was simply the interest in free marijuana and some occasional small gifts of money provided to them by Lindbergh Sanders. Meetings were held at various homes primarily that of Lindbergh Sanders. But as I say, it did involve drinking wine, smoking marijuana, and reading the Bible. As far as we can determine, the cult numbered no more than 25 individuals. And as far as we know at this point, it has no apparent connection with any other organized group or cult. It appears that Lindbergh Sanders was recognized as their leader. The basic beliefs of the cult, insofar as we've been able to determine, is simply, or a few of those we've been able to determine, its principal tenet was that marijuana is a God-given herb, and therefore it's a gift of God. They believe that men should not cover their heads, but women should. They believe men should not shave or cut their hair. They also believe that the opinions of women aren't worth consideration and that women should not attend the same religious meetings as men. They believe that their members should not eat pork or drink clear water. However, Kool-Aid or wine was certainly acceptable. They believe the police are the devils. They also believe that white people can't go to heaven because the Bible was written for blacks only. They believe white people are heathen, and so are the blacks that act like white people, such as black police officers. They believe the Ten Commandments are to be obeyed. However, the cult members were forbidden to go to any church because they believe the churches are filled with false prophets and hypocrites. They prohibited cult members from shaving, excuse me, from shaking hands. They did not believe in physicians or medical attention. They also believed that the Bible study should emphasize the Old Testament. I think that furnishes you with a fairly detailed description of the group of people and the beliefs that they held that we found ourselves dealing with last week. How did we come to be involved in this situation? At the time, there was a great deal of confusion, but I think we had been able to satisfactorily resolve any questions that we have on those particular points. There was a theft of a purse that occurred at a Kroger store on Peyton Street. A security officer there, Don Ross, who incidentally is or also happens to be a Memphis police officer, off-duty hours, he works at Kroger's as a security guard. 
I might point out at this time, too, that under our policies and procedures, any officers that are engaged in security work is, in effect, decommissioned or he has no police authority during the time he is serving as a security agent for some other organization. The theft of a purse was reported to the security guard, Mr. Ross, at Kroger. Now, based on a physical description that was furnished him, he felt that he may know the individual involved. Mr. Ross is a former school teacher, and he thought, based on the physical description, plus he had seen several people leaving the, school, leaving the store, that he knew who the individual was. Mr. Ross called the police officers, Officers Renfro and Moon, who met Mr. Ross at the Peyton Street address. He informed them as to what had occurred, so the officers took Mr. Ross to 630 North 7th in order to investigate the theft of the purse. Upon arrival at that location, they talked to relatives of the individual that Mr. Ross thought might be responsible, a Michael Coleman, and it was determined that Mr. Coleman was not at home. The family did make arrangements, though, to put Mr. Ross in telephone contact with Mr. Coleman, who happened to be on Shannon Street at the home of Lindbergh Sanders. Mr. Ross attempted to talk to Coleman. He could hear in the background some very obscene language being used. He was making no headway in determining whether or not Mr. Coleman was in fact the person responsible for the theft of the purse, so he hung up. He, along with the officers, returned to the store. These officers were completing an offense report on the theft of the purse and that ended their involvement in this particular situation, but that is what apparently triggered the incident that followed. We now know that after Mr. Coleman received the telephone call while he was at the home on Shannon, he informed Lindbergh Sanders of what had occurred, and Mr. Sanders demanded that the police be called. Incidentally, before we move on, I might point out that subsequent investigation has determined that Mr. Coleman was not involved in the theft of the purse. All right, folks, that's going to... In this episode for today, just looking back on what we've covered so far in Director Holt's press conference, it seems to be fairly accurate, relatively truthful as far as I can tell, and from what the investigation showed, obviously that's always the in the eye of the beholder as to whether the what the police department is saying is actually true, but, I mean, he is correct that to do a proper investigation takes weeks and not days. You, If you start trying to discuss a incident like Shannon Street and try to throw something together in a few days, it's not going to be accurate. But, of course, the public and the media are always going to want answers now. But what he said, for the most part, sounded, I think, I think very accurate. The number of people involved and how the situation began, why the situation began, Looking back through to see if there's anything of interest to really point out that jumps out at you. And I really don't see anything so far. I, obviously, later on in the his news conference, there are going to be some issues that we're definitely going to discuss. But then again, at this early stage of the press conference, he's just laying down the groundwork for the events leading up to the incident. So we're probably not going to see any issues, but I think it is a fairly accurate account of the 
Lindbergh Sanders and and his uh, group of followers. So at least in that regard, we're we're on the same page. Even though I can promise you there are people that would disagree even with this part here. But it is based on physical evidence, witness accounts. You put those two together and you will get an accurate account or as accurate as you could get it. Yep, I really don't see anything. All right, folks, I do appreciate y'all hanging in for this first installment of Director Holt's press conference. We'll be back in a few days, and we'll continue to go through the press conference. I will add there will be questions from the media that Director Holt will answer as well, and, of course, we will go through those as well. And I'll give you my humble opinion based on the case file. And I will let you know if I'm giving an opinion and it's just my opinion and not something that the case file states otherwise. All right, folks. Enough babbling from me. We'll get together in a few days and continue our jaunt through this investigation. Until then, I'll see you down the road.